Hello, everyone. I don't need this, but I do for the live stream so that my voice is being picked up and we can record this uh, for later use. So I'm going to stand here, but we have a uh, mobile microphone, which perhaps um, Craig and Ajahn would like to use uh, later on. So welcome. It is my pleasure to see you all. I think quite a lot of familiar faces, but also some that less familiar faces. So it's great uh, to see you. We are really, really excited to be able to welcome two wonderful guests who have traveled all the way from the United States to share their insights and, I happen to know, debates uh, on the topic um, of social ecological resilience and what does that really even mean. <laughs> <clears throat> We're all like in the law section getting all excited about the debates. So let me just quickly run through the program for this afternoon. We'll start with just a very brief opening um, by myself, and then I will be handing over um, to our guests who are going to take us through step-by-step uh, -step, um, different activities and different uh, angles for the discussion, which is really uh, exciting. So we'll start with session one, looking at exploring. Um, and, I, and I understand that you're both going to then be leading a different part um, of that. So first, origins of social ecological resilience um, and then looking at environmental governance and then we'll have a break and I understand that all of our breaks will lead us back to where we were the Vesterdijk uh, room for uh, different refreshments and the walk will keep us uh, energized and then uh, when we get back we'll look at session two uh, interactive advances so with us together and I think because we're with a somewhat smaller group we might be able to uh, move the chairs around a bit and have more of a discussion format um, there. So, after we have um, our second part, we will then have sort of more moment for drinks and a discussion. Did you want to add anything um, to the program at this uh, point? I mean, especially just your brain <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, that sounds that sounds good, and I think you'll probably be plugging into lots of people's own brain dumps. So hopefully we can make it huge by the end of the afternoon. Ah, oh, I see we have uh, Nushka coming in. <laughs> Wonderful, welcome. Uh, nice to see you. Um, so I, it's my pleasure to uh, be sort of. Uh, I would say maybe chairing is too strong a word, but I will be around for the first half and then in the second half of the afternoon I'll be handing over to Marlene, uh, who will be uh, continuing my role because for family reasons, unfortunately, I have to leave a little bit earlier than uh, planned. But we are in Marlene's fantastic hands, so not worried at all. So we have two very distinguished guests today. First, Craig Allen, and I, I pr pronounced the names during lunch, so I know I'm doing this right. Um, resilient scientist. For all of us lawyers and governance people, really nice to get some more practical insights um, into the field that we're talking about. Uh, director of the Center for Resilience um, in Agricultural Working Landscapes and also a professor at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. So thank you. Welcome. Um, Ajahn, uh, you are a fellow but also a visiting professor here with us at the Center for Water, Oceans and Sustainability Law. And we really have years of working together with you. Um, we're very, very happy to welcome you back. You are also participating in a different uh, climate risk special issue that we've been working on together since 2019. So a long collaboration there um, with, uh, with fellow researchers. Um, and you're bringing us US perspectives. So that's very nice because it's very complementary. A lot of us are having the Dutch perspective um, and the comparisons bring a real value add. So thank you. Why am I standing here? <laughs> I'm standing here <laughs> because uh, I am one of the three leaders of the water, climate um, and future deltas community. It was previously the hub um, and now for the next five years we have transitioned into community form. Um, and basically what we seek to do is 
share as a platform interdisciplinary insights into concrete pathways to more resilient deltas in the future. So um, there are three of us, three ladies who are leading the community. Uh, myself from the Faculty of Law, Economics and Governance, and then we have uh, Marie Trefting, um, who is uh, Associate Professor in Ecology and Biodiversity. She came to our pitches last week with this great um, a coker, I don't know what that's called, like full of earth. She's like, this is us. We are the ground, the peatland that is sinking. Um, and Professor Esther Stalkamer, so she is our third Professor of Delta um, evolution. So we really have these three different perspectives on the very, very complex picture of the challenges faced by deltas and future directions. We are supported by a very experienced uh, board, one of which, Vain, sitting here. <laughs> um, and then uh, that kind of helps us also with embedding across the university as a whole and external stakeholders. So the aim is really to not just be there for science, but be there for society. Um, and that will help us to generate um, some real and implementable uh, ideas and pathways for the future. These are the guiding questions of the community, but I think they will also be guiding questions for some of the discussions we have today, because we have very vulnerable Delta region, and then a lot of competing interests. And I think the, at least the lawyers in the room are very familiar with competing interests. How do you balance them? Who has to do what? Um, what about time scales, short term and long term? Um, how do you divide costs and benefits when you have these responses? Um, what do you think about the way actors are currently doing it and how could they perhaps do it better in the future? And we have made this interesting diagram, which is a little bit complicated, so we're actually open to ideas about simplification, but the idea is you have a lot of interrelated challenges that deltas are facing, climate change, population growth. Everybody wants to be here and is competing. And then we need to come to actual solution pathways, and that requires a certain degree of vision into uh, where you want to be. And I don't know if we can even agree on where you want to be. Um, and then how do you get there? And that is, I think, even the problematization of that, defining the problem, and then the kind of solution you would need is a huge part of it when you have all these different disciplines speaking to each other. But today, we're going to be looking at social ecological resilience. And I just have a couple of teasers for you based on my introductory discussion. These topics may be dropped, so we'll see what we think. So one of them, defining the concept, what is social and ecological resilience, and I think once you define a concept, you start defining a problem. And you can even disagree on how to define that problem, and that will determine the kind of solutions you come up with. So it's a very interconnected conceptual exercise. Untapped capacity in the law. Is it a benefit, or you know, might a more conservative thinker consider it a risk? Panarchy? I'm not going to fill it in. I'm just looking at Craig. <laughs> He's going to fill it in. And uh, Humpty Dumpty. But we, well, now we have to do Humpty Dumpty. So with these teasers, I would like to hand over to our guests. Thank you so much. Um, and maybe we'll put the microphones on and you can take it over from here. Thank you. Okay, so now, does this work? Is this on? Hello? Yeah. Good, good. Uh, do you want to turn it up a little bit? Yeah, yes, I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, getting the microphone up near the mouth as well. Mm -hmm. So that works, maybe? Ah, yep, yep. Oh, figure out the technology as I go. But thank you for the introduction. Thank you, uh, everybody, for coming here today. It's always 
pleasure to get back to the Netherlands. I, I lived here when I was 16, 17 in Katwijk. Um, my father was at NIAS um, for a year, and so it's a good, a good introduction to the Netherlands for me for a year. I come back here thinking I can still speak Dutch, and I speak Dutch to people, and they have no idea what I'm saying. So, yeah, I've lost that. But it does feel a little bit like coming home because I'm so familiar. So happy to be here, and thank you for the invite um, coming here. I would, right now, so really just talk about the core concept of resilience and what it's come to mean, because it's come to mean many things. I, I, and I told this story at, at lunchtime, but uh, there is an organization that C.S. Holling um, began, C.S. Holling's the father of resilience theory called the Resilience Alliance. And the effort there was to bring together ecologists, social scientists, and economists. So back on an early attempt at interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, or what we call in the U.S. now, convergence research. And, and the Resilience Alliance still exists, um, still pushing out resilience ideas. But uh, in 2007, we've been working away trying to get resilience ideas out, and, and we were on, in Corsica at a meeting, and a CEO of a, a non-government organization that was funding us started a presentation to us saying, I have good news and bad news for the Resilience Alliance. The good news is you guys have been successful. Resilience is everywhere now. The bad news is you no longer have control of this idea. You can't control the message or the terminology. And, and I'd say is correct on both fronts. And we've seen a, a real sort of, I think this is sort of a property of, of novel and new emerging science, is that there's all kinds of competing, competing ideas, different definitions. It's, you know, and it has not had the test of time yet. The original resilience idea did, but um, it's, it's, it's really exploding and we'll see what sorts out over time. But there's confusion about resilience and what it means often. And confusion that led, led uh, myself and Ajahn and, and several colleagues to publish a paper just a couple years ago in Nature Sustainability called Resilience Reconciled, trying to put together what these alternative ideas of resilience are. And that's what I'm going to talk about right now. I'm also going to give a, a small example because I think some, the resilience idea, not so complex necessarily, it can get very complex, but panarchy gets very complex. And so we'll illustrate with some examples here and there, and I think Ajahn will as well to try to make the points that we can't in a more abstract sense. So thank you. Uh, focus not so much on origins of resilience, um, but more on the different meanings of resilience and how it's used today and how they differ and how it really matters what you're talking about, because it really does. It's different. There's really two main competing ideas and the implications of each are very, very different. So it's important. Um, first, that worked? Good. Um, I would like to acknowledge Buzz Hong. He was the father of um, resilience theory. He created the Resilience Alliance. He published the idea of ecological resilience. And I will say ecological resilience sometimes, it, it really is social ecological resilience now. So if I slip, I'm an ecologist, sorry, if I slip and say ecological resilience, I really mean SES or social ecological resilience because the idea is broadened and expanded. When Buzz wrote the resilience paper in 1973, there are still thoughts that there are pristine ecological systems and eco ecologists like to go places and work where there's no human influence, right? And, and, and that died. But, but this idea of resilience came out when, when Buzz was just thinking about ecological systems. But by the time he founded the Resilience Alliance, he was clearly trying to incorporate social and economic and other aspects as well. So it, it evolved as things do. Real core of resilience has come to mean three very different things. It's meant to mean a rate of return, and I'll explain this all in a little bit. It's often used as a process. I'm not gonna talk about the process definition much, because when I mean process, people use the term resilience like we are going to build 
or enhance resilience. Those kind of verb usages of the term can be applied to either of the two sort of competing definitions of resilience. So I'm not going to talk much about using resilience as a verb, the process of enhancing, fostering resilience. And then there's this idea of resilience being an emergent property of complex, adaptive, social ecological systems. And that's where I sit right now. So the first definition, and this is what most people mean when they say resilience. And the cinnamon for this would be resiliency. If you see the term resiliency, the, what is really being focused on is return time, or, or what Holling phrased years ago, engineering resilience. Engineers are com concerned with material properties and physical properties of systems have different concerns than social ecological scientists do. So the resilience idea is resiliency or engineering resilience definition is simply rate of return following disturbance, which is very simple, very easy, and, and um, used by engineers because you want to return functionality as soon as possible, regardless of anything else. There's some issues with it. It really does catch the dynamics that we see when there's not a threshold present in the system or when a threshold isn't exceeded. In fact, most of the disturbance that all of the systems we manage and are interested on, most of those disturbances don't cross a threshold. So return time is critically important. And it's often all you need to know 95% of the time because the system hasn't collapsed. Return time is important. However, I definitely have to acknowledge the fact that ideas of engineering resilience require that the system be non-stationary. So the system is changing constantly. What do you bounce back to? That's a big issue. I, I dabble in the area of restoration ecology. When we restore systems, it's always a question. What do we restore back to? And what of the system that was collapsed? Think of a, a city um, hit by a hurricane, New Orleans, with Hurricane Katrina. The place that was flooded was the ninth ward of New Orleans. Um, arguably, it was a very poverty-stricken ward. And returning exactly how it was post-disturbance wouldn't make a lot of sense. So these systems are changing. It's difficult to know what to return to. And also, Engineers require the assumption that there is an equilibrium state. That there is something to return back to. That the system's not crazy dynamic, but unfortunately, our systems are sort of crazy dynamic. So again, engineering resilience um, usually sort of characterize is resilience questions like this. You have a system state. You have some critical function you're involved in. Maybe it's flood control. Maybe it's something else, depending on your system is a perturbation, a flood, or something else. And what's important is that recovery time. And it's nice, because it's, it's a recovery time. You couldn't have an easier thing to document and quantify. And there are issues of quantifying social e ecological resilience. They're very complicated questions, and it's difficult. Engineering resilience, much simpler to quantify. Challenge, of course, as I stated, is that social ecological systems we live in are non-stationary. They are constantly changing, both socially, biophysically, et cetera. We see that now with climate change clearly accelerating and impacts clearly pretty much everywhere, pretty astounding. So we're living in non-stationary systems, so we need a definition that copes with non-stationarity. And very importantly, and this is the original contention of Holling when he proposed the idea of resilience, alternative stable states are possible in systems, which means that there's some threshold in the system. If you disturb it enough, you cross that threshold, and the system collapses, if you will, and, go in and can emerge as another alternative stable state. Classic examples are shallow lakes. This can be in a clear state, or given phosphorus input that can be absorbed over a long time, but then there's a sudden flip 
for your trophic state in the system. Both those states are very resilient. They're both states of the same system in space, but they're very different ecological states. The idea of resilience, when Buzz put it out, Buzz Holling, um, was ignored by science. And about 10 years after his publication, then it got attacked. And it got attacked by prominent ecologists. It got attacked because they claimed there was no evidence for alternative staple states in any system anywhere. Part of the problem then is we didn't have time series of data long enough in data streams to really establish the existence of alternative stable states. I think it's fair to say now that 99% of ecologists would agree that there is alternative stable states and it's been documented in almost every type of ecological and social ecological system you can think of. For example, coral reefs are another one where these dynamics are pretty well worked out. So the resilient, social ecological resilience definition is then an emergent property of complex systems. And in its simplest form, is simply a measure of the amount of disturbance it takes to flip a system from one state to another. How much disturbance can it take before that cross threshold is crossed and the system, coral, healthy coral reef, turns into a coral reef that's bleached? So fairly simple idea in abstract, and of course in, in practice much more complicated than that. Alternative stable states in aquatic systems, I have to show that in um, terrestrial systems as well, a huge issue. I work in uh, Nebraska. Nebraska is a state that's in the Great Plains of the U.S., totally grassy. Now it's uh, many places of it, you'd think it's a forest. And so this transition from grass to forest is ongoing and is an alternative stable state across most of Nebraska. And so one question, of course, is why do we care about the emergence of alternative stable states? Well, livelihoods are fundamentally changed. This is a ranching state. People are making their living grazing cattle. And when this happens, forage production just drops. So it affects livelihoods, the same thing with lakes, transferring from, from um, clear to eutrophic, it affects livelihoods, it affects biodiversity, it affects all components of the system. And often the dynamics are very simple. The dynamics in coral reefs, there's a couple processes that can cause bleaching um, in, in systems like this. It's simply the loss, lack of fire in the system. So as a clear, single driving process that's been altered by humanity in this case. We've lost the cultural use of fire in Nebraska and what's emerged is trees. There's always some complications involved. I mean, we also have fragmentation going on. We also have these social aspects that ranchers like this, but like everywhere else, places are gentrifying. Even places like this, you have wealthy landowners from Omaha and cities who value this for hunting. So they're not making livelihoods, but they'd rather have a treed environment. And so there's these conflicts here. And there is this norm, I, I always say resilience isn't normative, it's just this measure. But we do value the alternative stable states differently. And so you have tensions. And in Nebraska, you have this tension between wealthy ex outside landowners and the people making a living raising cattle. So, Always some interesting dynamics there. So to contrast, engineering resilience is really the return time, recovery, or resiliency. Ecological resilience is often shown like this. I sort of call this the Russian hills, but to really have that metaphor work right now, these should be bomb-marked craters to show the Russian hills. Just kidding. I'm, Ukra I'm Ukrainian in heritage. <laughs> Um, so, so a little different in the way they think about things. In, in ecological resilience, the main thing is this concern about flipping and crossing this threshold from one stable state to another. And in a little more sophisticated showing of alternative stable states, they're not just really two-dimensional hills, but stability landscapes. And these landscapes also change. So the resilience of the system is dependent upon the state of the system, the ball and the cup but also the stability landscape itself, how deep it is, etc. 
So resilience model, when you go through an alternative stable state, simply this, disturbance, change the state of the system, cross the threshold, you're in a different state of the system. Both systems with basins of attraction, both systems, or both states of the system. Resilience. And as I said, it's not just moving the state of the, the ball around in the cup, it's the landscape itself can slowly change with changing, like slow sea level rise is slowly reducing the basin of attraction for, say, a floodplain system so that the resilience threshold is lowered over time. So resilience, simply a measure of the amount of the disturbance needed to flip a system from one stable state to another stable state, and both desirable and undesirable states of systems can be resilient. So that eutrophic lake, that undesirable system, can be highly resilient. So people, again, sometimes think resilience is a good thing, it's normative. In, in my world, it's not. Resilience is just that measure. The normative comes in and how you value the alternative state. And of course, degraded systems, this used to be a grassland, now it's a woodland. These provide fewer goods and services to humans. We're living in places where we have sort of co-adapted, co-evolved over time. If there's a sudden transition, you lose those livelihoods. True, often it opens up alternatives, but often in a degraded state of the system. Another reason why we're concerned, and here's my example, is hysteresis. So the Platte River, anybody heard of the Platte River? Probably not. So it's, it's a braided stream that comes, is fed by snowmelt out of the Rocky Mountains and goes all the way across the Great Plains and into the Missouri and then Mississippi rivers. A typical stream that should look like this minus the trees completely. So flooding pulses come in the spring from snowmelt in the mountains. It just wipes out any vegetation that grew over the winter months and spring, scours the islands, and then this open sandbar system, critically important for the central flyway. So 11 million ducks and geese come to a 50 mile wide part of the Platte River. Every sandhill crane in the continent comes in this 50 mile wide portion for roosting. So it's ecologically critically important. But it used to look like this. We're humans, there was water, there's a need for rural electrification in the 1930s. So we built the Kingsley Dam, dammed the river, it stopped the movement of sediment, it stopped pulsing flows, and of course, along with building hydroelectric capacity, there's also a massive scheme of canalization, canals for irrigation. This is probably the most productive farmland in the world. Irrigated flatland corn production, and it's totally dominated the Platte River Valley. Um, irrigation pits, the river, notice no sandbars. It's totally wooded now. And the river itself, the Platte River, is fully or over-appropriated. So all the water of the Platte River is accounted for, more than is in the Platte River. In fact, the Platte River, when I left Nebraska last week, is dry. This is a fourth, fifth order stream. It's dry. So what do we do? For farmers, this alternative state of the river is good. It provides irrigation water. It provides um, agriculture productivity. For ecologists, it sucks because migratory birds can't use the river anymore. It's critically important for the biodiversity in the continent. So we're looking at a situation like this where the um, sandbars have been hardened. So they first were invaded by native herbaceous vegetation, then by invasive vegetation, Phragmites. Thanks for sending it over. Just kidding. <laughs> this is Eurasian Phragmites. It's a real issue here. And then after that came in, you got trees, cottonwoods. So it's hardened. So now the river no longer moves the channels. The sandbars are hardened with vegetation. You can't get the original process back. So even if we've let a major pulse and flood down the river, it wouldn't do anything because it's hysteretic. So if a system's not hysteretic, all we'd have to do is put in that original process, floods, and we'd get the system back how we wanted it. But you can't hear. What we'd have to do is cut down the trees, and they're big, then remove them, 
Then we have a poison, the Phragmites, and all the other vegetation. But all those things have root systems, and they're persistent. So you have a plow the river, literally. When I moved to Nebraska, I was shocked to see tractors plowing the riverbed. That's the management that's done. So, and herbiciding an entire river out of helicopters and from the river to kill Phragmites. So what was created is, and I won't get in, this is a legal thing, a tri-state compact to restore the Platte River, which we could talk about for tons, but we won't. What it resulted in is this federal program, the Platte River um, Implementation, I'm going to forget the acronym, but it's really Platte River Recovery and Adaptive Management Plan. They've spent so far in about 15 years $200 million. And what's done is basically gardening the river. You poison the trees, and you plow it, and you actually pump sand. So in this little 50-mile stretch, we sort of maintain the previous state of the system, but only through coercion heavy human hand. So it's totally artificial, but it's maintaining this. If this river wasn't hysteretic, the flip from one state to another would be really simply simple to rectify. But in many, many cases, it's not. So a real reason to foster resilience in, in systems that are in a desirable state and to erode resilience in systems in undesirable state and transform them. I won't really talk about that. Just to tell you the scale of some of these changes, this is the Great Plains of America, total grassland. Everything brown here is now dominated by woody vegetation. It's a biome level transition that's not only happening in the US Great Plains, but in South Africa, Australia, elsewhere in the world where grasslands exist. Grasslands are one of the most threatened biomes or the most threatened biome in the world. And as you can see, I, I have this animate in another, animate in another slide, but this uh, woody transition is moving northward, and it's moving northward rapidly, changing the entire system, a biome level regime shift that we're witnessing today. So again, it's in humanity's interest, in my mind, to maintain systems and enhance their resilience when in desirable states. But then there's this uh, idea of transformation that Jean will talk about a little bit, where we purposely erode resilience in systems that are in undesirable states. And then during the reorganization phase, and this is where panarchy comes in, uh, during that reorganization phase, help foster the creation of a state of a system that's more desirable for humanity. Yep, and I think that was it. That was it. Yes, sir. The social ecological resilience, yes. Neutral concept, when, when you hear the term resiliency used, they're usually putting a normative that it's a good thing to be resilient. But they're not considering the possibility of alternative stable states and in engineering them. They would argue there aren't. I think Ajahn will talk about the fact that engineered systems are really just situate, situated within natural systems and really can't be disconnected like that. You know, I think in some cases it's necessary. If we didn't do this coercion in the, in the Platte River, we would lose this huge, critically important connectivity across the hemisphere and biodiversity in terms of 
avian communities especially. So in some cases, it's, it's critical. The idea of resilience is sort of predicated upon the idea that these systems do self-organize and shouldn't need that kind of interference. But with a heavy hand of humans, sometimes, for example, where the process of, is floods or fire, we just can't let those run across the landscape now. So in, in some cases, either that's a holding power pattern so we can maintain things we value until we can get natural processes back, or, or maybe that's the future for some systems that we basically farm them. So I think of agricultural systems as being totally coerced, right? The minute we stop farming them, they'll shift to something different. So yeah, it's always a tough question. It depends on the system and how much, how much people value it. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. When it comes to alternative stable states, that is, is the human valuation is critical. That's, what, that's why I use that plant example, because it's a desirable state of the system for agriculture. And it's a totally undesirable state for ecology. And, and you could say that with the grassland, too. It's, when it's in grass, it's desirable for livestock production, the people who live there. But the wooded state is valued by other people. And, and so, yeah, the valuation comes in, and who wins is a, is a different kind of question, but an important one, right? optimism too because and this is kind of difficult what I'm going to say but I'll just go ahead and say the, the reason you know there's the planetary boundaries concept right you know I'm probably familiar with that but if you're not that you know many of the thresholds have already been exceeded for earth well if that's the case then why hasn't the world collapsed this is work hold on let me figure this out I can't multitask um, why hasn't the world collapsed well because the earth has this inherent capacity resilience so for self-organization, right, at multiple scales. Um, and so it's been able to maintain that, you know, 
essentially uh, safe space, as a kind of silly word, what, what, maybe there's something better to say than that, for, for humankind, right, at small scales. But over time, you can see that we are eroding that capacity, that inherent capacity that Earth has. It's just nobody created it. It's just an emergent property. It's self-organization, right? I mean, you can think about, so what's self-organization? I mean, I think simple examples would be like, well, you cut yourself, right? Did anybody tell the, the wound to heal? It just does it itself. It's just, you know, this is just, you know, you know, living systems. They have this capacity, inherent capacity to do this sort of thing. Now, but that can be exceeded, right, at some point, and then bad things start happening. And you say, yeah, it, it depends, right? Because, yeah, we all like having great food all the time, and, you know, guess what? There's a cost associated with that, too. Now, could it all transition away then from, you know, more like industrial agriculture and things of this nature? That's a, another really, well, that's more your, what you're looking at, and Craig to an extent, too. So maybe we could touch upon that, too, because really that's, that, those are the big issues, right? Because you're right, it's, it's incredible challenges. So I'll do some of my stuff. How's the sound? Sound okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I work for the U.S. government, so our slides are very drab. Why is this not doing a slideshow? Am I doing something wrong? Oh, it is a slideshow. Okay, good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to talk about, okay, first of all, thank you so much for coming, all of you. Um, Marlene, thank you so much for hosting me again and bringing this guy, you know. Um, and uh, I guess, well, Hansman Cooper is not here, but thank, thanks to him, too, um, for, you know, it's wonderful, it's beautiful to see you know, familiar faces, some just through Zoom and Teams, but hey, you know. We did what we could. So, um, anyway, what I'm going to talk about is, so Craig was really touching upon um, the background, the history, you know, which really evolved from ecology and systems uh, science. I mean, that's really where that particular concept came from. And it's a systems perspective, and that's absolutely critical. So, I'll, and you're going to hear me keep saying that over and over. <clears throat> but, so I'll talk about it from an applied sense, so governance um, for social ecological systems. And social ecological systems, all of that really, at least the way we think of it, is that's just an ecosystem. The social just means it's just humans included. We're not going to go, you know, much further than that. Because for the longest time in that disciplinary tradition, you didn't even consider humans as part of ecosystems, which is, which is absurd. Because every ecosystem on Earth is touched by humans, either directly or indirectly. Okay? Okay, so I think this helps maybe frame it. Why is that not going? What did you do to that? Oh, oh, this one. What button did you push? Yeah, I did that. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I think this is a good way to frame stuff. I think lawyers can, and I think most of the folks in here are law, uh, law students or law professors, <clears throat> have, can understand it hopefully a little bit better from this perspective. Um, at least from the U.S. perspective, I, again, I have to make assumptions. I don't know civil law, I don't know, you know Dutch law, I don't know EU law, but hopefully separate the U.S. stuff from it and also even that's coming from the U.S., the common law, and think of it in terms of how some of this stuff would apply with your particular context. So that's what I have to ask you to do during this talk, separate and uh, reacquaint <laughs> from your side, okay? So preservation, what is it? Well, it's keeping things as they are. Um, and I think that's probably a common concept throughout the world. Um, and a good example of that is national parks in the United States. They're, they're meant to be kept static, which is, you know, increasingly difficult these days. Um, and then mitigation. Um, returning things to what they were, uh, hopefully that's obvious, right? A good example is endangered species, trying to get endangered species back to some historic baseline that they were before, right? Um, what's that? <laughs> Mitigation is similar. Yeah, it's similar. I think the restoration people would say that actually encompasses this, probably some of this too. I don't know, think I, I don't know if I agree. Craig actually knows more about restoration than me. That's more of a... I mean, I have a, a bit of a background in ecology, but not like him. So we'll, we'll ask him that question. <laughs> um, so that's, that's why it's good to have a tag team. You know, somebody who's more like some ecology, but I have a law, not policy, and anthropology. And then you have an ecologist, right? <clears throat> so, 
So adaptation, this is where you start getting into more of the systems perspective, right? Because you're just adjusting the system to the current conditions. You know, a good example is uh, protecting and constructing wetlands in coastal areas. I think that's something that you're quite familiar with. Um, and then transformation. This is something that is, nobody really wants to do it. And honestly, it was defined so badly that I, I don't know what people were doing for the most part, at least from the perspective of the underpinning uh, biophysical systems, the living systems. If you're dealing with that, then you need to think of it in, on, under these terms, at least at the very core, in my opinion, before you get on to all the other stuff that is built on from social sciences, from law, from you know whatever, engineering, from other disciplines. Because if you're dealing with a living system, you need to understand it from that, from the really core basic principles before you, you move on from that. Because if not, that means your foundation is incorrect. And that's what I found a lot in the literature. So what it means is, or how I define it and Craig, deliberately shifting to a new system in response to accelerating environmental change, okay? Um, and so nobody wants to hear it, but it might mean withdrawal from coastal areas, right? But it also has other uh, manifestations. I'm gonna show you some of that later. Um, within a city, and so maybe that will somehow pop in terms of ways in which it could be useful for, from the Dutch perspective, because we're going to have to think about that. At least we will. You'll have to educate us a bit. We, you know, we have a, a base understanding, and which is just, you know, it's it's a pretty uh, massive issue. Okay, so <clears throat> classic environmental research rulemaking: identify a goal, you know, something like number of endangered species, right? Optimize on that. Um, it, it's noble, but it's flawed, um, and that's my experience, at least in the U.S., um, because when you're optimizing on one species, there are all sorts of undesirable consequences for the entire system, okay? Um, I'll give you an example. Like, when I was doing my, my sea turtle research many moons ago, um, we were, you know, tasked under the Endangered Species Act to make more sea turtles. That was it. Sea turtles endangered, make more turtles. So, there were raccoons, which are... There were, uh, you know, it's, it's true, it was basically command control. Make them, you know, uh, and then there were raccoons, which are a native predator in this 10,000 islands mangrove ecosystem where I was. We have the top level native predator, and, but they were eating the turtle nests, right? So we were tasked with getting rid of the raccoons, euthanizing raccoons, which I didn't want to do, but this is, we, we got to make more turtles. So we did it. But guess what? That's what back then, I, even then, it was, that's when I first started thinking about this, I realized it's like, this is ridiculous. I mean, what about all the other, you know, undesirable consequences that we've caused by taking out the top-level predator in this ecosystem? I mean, so anyway, just a quick aside. That, so that got me thinking about this many, many years ago. Um, <clears throat> so that limits the ability to manage the ecosystem. Um, a lack of systems perspective. Okay, and then cumulative impacts. This is a good, uh, good example, too. Okay, so imagine everybody here in this room has like an acre of land. What's, what's a good... Uh, hectare. Hectare. Hectare, let's do hectare. <laughs> um, hectare, and then say you take, say it has wetlands on it on say like a quarter of it, and you decide, well, you know, I want to put a sandbox in there for my kids or like a, a shed or whatever, right? So you decide, I'm just going to do that, you know? Well, guess what? That, the, all those little small actions have this capacity to scale up, right? We, we think it's no big deal, right? Numerous small conversions is death by a thousand cuts. And it has then this capacity to scale up, this cumulative effect of all these small conversions manifesting into large-scale degradation and loss of the ecosystem services associated with pet, uh, wetlands. So this is like, this is kind of a panicky idea in terms of, unfortunately, it's not just top-down in terms of the ways in which ecosystems are uh, uh, governed by the naturally existing processes. Maybe not the best way to say that, but I think you get the idea. It, you know, the resilience of these systems can be eroded to a point where it can cause broader scale impacts that are not desirable for humankind. Okay, so Craig hit that. Um, and so social ecological resilience, which is you know this broader, and really what it is is just ecological resilience with the humans tossed on, okay? That's all it is. And then, but it encompasses adaptation, which is one configuration, the current. You're trying to keep to adjust that and keep it as it is. But it gets, there's more flexibility associated with that. It's, it's not just going back to an end point, you know, like uh, mitigation, right? You're, you know, it, it, there's a, a degree of flexibility that's allowed within adaptation. Whereas transformation is deliberately shifting, human agency is the key here, to a new configuration or new system, okay? Okay, so how do we deal 
with you know this dynamism that exists within living systems. Well, some of the ways, and also like this tension that I found like with law, um, you know, 15 years ago when I started really working in this area. I mean, I had the law degree before, but really starting to think about it combined with the resilience concepts. Um, adaptive management, um, and so that's just a structured iterative process that you know is dependent upon monitoring data, and it feeds back over time at decision points, right? And so through that process, you can adapt and learn and reduce uncertainty through time. So that's one strategy that, but it's under you know, a specific cir uh, set of circumstances that's really most highly effective. But I won't really go into that. We can talk about that later. I just wanted to give you some examples of some things as ways to deal with that tension between you know, uh, ecosystems and law, okay? And then adaptive governance, if some of you know it, uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to go into great depth about it, but you know, part of it is it's, it's a strategy for dealing with it. It's broader, right? I mean, uh, hopefully, you folks know. Now we'll we'll talk about governance at the end if, if it's not clear. <clears throat> but you know, aspect of it is like developing capacity. You know, and this is things like bridging organizations, um, uh, and this is just one piece of it. There's a whole host of factors, right? But these things resolve conflicts, and they can monitor uh, organizations at multiple scales and facilitate communication, which is really important. Um, okay, so monitoring is important, but in a structured, iterative manner, okay? And then adaptively assessing the responses at decision points. Okay, and so where I am now in terms of, you know, probably for the past you know, 10, so I've been those 15 years, at least the law and resilience stuff, 10 years I kept advocating for broad-scale legal reforms, particularly I was really critical of the Endangered Species Act for reasons I just kind of highlighted, um, but then realized, you know what? In the political climate in the US, we might lose the Endangered Species Act. Uh, so that's, we don't want to lose that, because <laughs> then we have nothing at all. That's the, you know, this minor road we already have, the principle of non-regression. That's how dangerous it was, right? So advocating for, say, for an ecosystem management act, which would be better, um, it's really not gonna happen. And so after banging the head and doing all sorts of other, like, you know, more pie in the sky, large scale reform type, you know, research and papers, you were part of some of it. Um, I came to this, you know, kind of like, and also frustration with international law. I mean, we see that it hasn't really, you know, worked so far in terms, particularly with respect to climate change, right? We, know, we all know this, unfortunately. Um, start lo looking at local scales, start trying to do things at small scales. And I'm not saying, you know, exclude, we should give up and not pursue international law. I mean, absolutely not. I'm not saying that. You have to do both. I think that since there is this frustration, we have to do as much as we can at smaller scales, um, you know, whether it be local, whether it be you know, states or province, whatever it is, and also at national, just do as much as possible. And also do it by mining these untapped capacities that are already in the law, right? I mean, for lawyers, I think it's not really that strange. And most, you know, when I told, I remember, I told J.B. Rule about this idea, <clears throat> and he was like, and I knew it too. And he's like, there's nothing new here. And I was like, yeah, you know why? Because you're a lawyer. Lawyers think this way. Nobody else thinks this way. I mean, ecologists don't think this way. Social scientists don't think this way. They don't understand that there is this, this interpretation, this flexibility in law that doesn't really seem to be there. There is, though, right? And so then he was like, oh, and it was light on. So I got it. It was great. <laughs> um, so uh, the example, then, at least from the U.S., is the Clean Water Act. Right? So the language is basically protect water quality, you know? But then we interpret it as using green infrastructure for urban green, inf uh, urban green transformation in the U.S. And so green infrastructure, I don't like to talk about that, and stuff like rain gardens, constructive wetlands, urban ag, there's more, I'll tell you more. Um, okay, so then what I've gotten to over time is this concept of resilience governance, which encompasses adaptive governance and transformative governance. So you have this capacity for adaptation, this capacity for transformation. It's encompassed under the same heading. And so depending on the circumstances, you do one or the other, okay? And so, and it also evolved from the fact, my real frustration with adaptive governance. It, was, it mentions law, says, yeah, law is important. There's no law. That's basically what it says, law is important. I mean, come on. I mean, at least the historic stuff, you know, from mid 2000s, maybe the newer stuff is much better. I think it probably is. Yeah, at least the folks that um, I'm aware of. Um, and the intermediaries, that's very similar. And then terrible job matching organizations to the appropriate ecosystem scales that they're managing. Okay, terrible job with that. So, panarchy comes in there, I know. 
So it's a really deep one. <laughs> we'll, we'll do our best here shortly. Um, okay, so let me give you a bit of an example on a teaser for the case study I'm going to give you. Um, here's the United States. Uh, here's Ohio. Here's Cleveland. Cleveland, Ohio. And this is Lake Erie. Huge, you know, basically freshwater sea. Um, it's massive. And what's the issue? Well, uh, and I think that you have them in the Netherlands too, these combined sewers. Right? The, do you folks have the, do you have combined sewers here anymore? Basically where like if there's large rain events, like untreated raw sewage just blasts out into water bodies. Or is that all? You still have them, right? Yeah. So that's, that's a massive issue in the U.S. It, yeah. So it, and historically, that was a great idea, right? You didn't want place to, uh, cities to flood. You wanted to just get the water away as quickly as possible, right? But over time, it's become a public health and environmental issue. I mean, look at this. This, this lake, how big is Lake Erie? Do you know? It's massive. It's unbelievably huge. You know, I mean, it, it's a sea. And look, you can see the plumes from space. I mean, this is the city of Cleveland here, which is a city of massive, I should, I should know this, but oh, I don't. It's two and a half million people, huge city. And you can see these plumes, and it is raw, untreated sewage, all the chemicals, all the, you know, the oils, all the crud from off of the rooftops, the streets, the sidewalks. And when there's big rain events, it all goes out and blasts untreated into, you know, your water bodies. And this is, you know, the rivers. I mean, we don't want to show that. This is the lake. And you can look at these plumes. I mean, see? And that's from space. <laughs> so, uh, now it's not a constant thing, but over time, what it does is it erodes, again, the capacity of this system to, I mean, it, it's, we've been doing it for centuries now, right? And so eventually, at some point, it becomes a real issue. So, we were tasked with dealing with this issue. And so, one of the ways, like I mentioned, the Clean Water Act, right? Fix the water quality. Well, we thought, okay, you can either do it with gray pipes, which are expensive, and they don't have any ancillary benefits. Nothing, it's just a pipe in the ground, right? Or through the green strategies, which, you know, rain gardens, constructed wetlands, uh, urban ag, um, urban prairies, uh, wildflower gardens. Anyway, I'll show you some. You can, uh, yeah, the earlier picture you showed also showed the new green possibility outbreaks. That's what the lake is shifting to. You can see it from space. This is in the western side. Never even heard. Yeah. So yeah, this is what I meant, like the warning signal. This is, yeah, this is in the western part of Lake Erie. This, they had to shut down the drinking water system for a city of like 1.5 million people. And it, because of uh, blue green algae, you know, which is this toxic um, cyanobacteria? Anyway, <laughs> not my area. <laughs> and it's, it's in the process of being eroded. Yeah, but, but not going to be not good for humankind. It's, yeah, it's going to be toxic. You're not going to be able to get fish. You're not going to be able to recreational opportunities, drinking water. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing is once you flip. Yeah, yeah hysteresis is that you can't get once you get it out. The path out isn't as easy as the path in. See what I mean? Right. Yeah, okay. Anyway, so what we did is and how am I doing on time? Doing okay. Okay. Anyway, so this is Cleveland, and here's Lake Erie. And then so what you see, the green is the, the existing green space, and there's lots of it. There's a bunch of city parks and state parks, which that's good, right? Then the red city, uh, sorry, Cleveland is a uh, post-industrial city, meaning 50 years ago it started to lose its manufacturing base. I don't think, you, you probably have some of these problems in the Netherlands, I think. But in the U.S. it's a massive issue. Where, um, you know, you had manufacturing of like steel and cars and all sorts of chemicals. I mean, everything, right? It's all pretty much gone now. It's all vaporized. And so what you're left then with is, these red is all vacant lots. I mean, you can see it's unbelievable, right? Um, and this is all businesses that are, you know, abandoned or people's homes because they left and abandoned their, their mortgages because they couldn't pay their mortgage anymore. So it's a massive issue. Um, and so 2010 is when we started this one. Um, and this is just, I'm just going to give you a quick snapshot so you see. So, and at this time, I can tell you, I can't really, I don't have a video of it, but it was so bad, depressed. It was just gray, and there was trash and crime and just burned out buildings and just, it was just an awful place and really scary and depressing. And, you know, all of the things that you thought of in post industrial, like horror show, right? I mean, in Cleveland, actually, this area where we did our project, the Guardian at the time called it the epicenter of the mortgage collapse of 2008. Because when we got to our project, well, I'll tell you about it later. This is just a tease for the, the, the actual project. 
So that's, yeah, there we go, that's important. See from that to that, about 10 years later. And so that's the exact same spot, but now you have this, you know, this beautiful feature, right? It's aesthetically pleasing. The water is coming off of the streets, brought into here, kept out of the sewers. That's important, I'll tell you more about that later. Um, so the water is kept out of the sewers, right? That's the critical part, and it's allowed to infiltrate here. And then these, they're not blooming right now, but they, they have blooms that attract pollinators, this particular type of rain garden. And they have a nice little place to sit. It's kind of hard to see. Well, it's better than what was there before. <laughs> so, um, and then things like this. This is a little uh, pocket prayer, they call it. It's a wildfire garden. Really nice, attracts pollinators, you know. I mean, it really does. I mean, it's, it might seem silly, but it completely transforms the place when you do stuff like this. It's ama it was amazing, the shift. And so, and now here's the panarchy. We'll, we'll do it later. But so, the, the idea here then is you can start small, parcel, lot scale, and then try slow, through time to go to, to make this transformation through time to larger scales, neighborhood scale, and then ultimately city scale, but that would take decades. So. Uh, oh yeah, the money, well, there was a Cleveland Botanical Garden. I'll tell you a lot about that more. I have the, the case study, I hit all that. It's okay if I do it then? I mean, I, um, anyway, so lessons learned. Uh, like we started out doing adaptive governance, right? For this particular, actually adaptive management, then adaptive governance, and, and it, or it, it combined with those two things. And then through time, I realized, you know, what we're doing is transform transformation. I mean, what we're doing is we're fundamentally changing the structures and the processes here. What do I mean by that? That's how you know it's transformation. The structure here is the, the stormwater and sewer infrastructure, the water and sewer infrastructure, right? Gray pipes under the ground, that's it, or this green component, you know, which is, you know, has all these incredible ancillary benefits, right? So there's, there's the structure, and then the process, at least what, from our perspective, EPA, what we were tasked with, was the hydrologic cycle, trying to restore the hydrologic cycle, right? So that, that's, it's, it's a small scale transformation, but it is, and it all, the scale, and scaling through time. It has been, right? And, and the idea, right, that all multiple cities in Lake Erie could do that, that we could- Oh, yeah. Put yeah. Back to Excellent point, state. excellent point. Well, okay, let me tell you about this. Okay, so framing, that's important, right, for this type of thing. Think about it. So you have the, like, the engineers love the, the gray pi the pipes because it's easy. They know, I mean, that you can calculate that quite easily. The, the rain gardens, it's much harder, as I understand it, much more difficult to calculate how they're going to do, right? So you have to have framing and agenda setting. You have to have, and the reason that worked is because Cleveland was in such a bad state. It was so down that they were willing to do it. The city's broke, and they were under a consent decree from the U.S. government for five billion dollars to do the, to build out their their stormwater and sewer infrastructure to fix it. And so the the price was five billion for gray over 25 years, which is for a broke city, it's unbelievable. People were going crazy, you know, especially in the U.S. Any taxes? Huh. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, people were going nuts. I mean, it was so they can't. So they were going, oh, okay, fine. We'll listen to the hippies. We'll let the hippies come in with these green ideas, you know, about like you know, urban ag and things, because they had nothing else to lose. I mean, they were completely, uh, I don't want to say screwed up. Yeah, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were in bad shape. <laughs> they were in a really bad spot. So, but there is increased risk tolerance because of that. But that, what we found is because there was concerns that, oh, it's going to cause flooding, there's going to be mosquitoes. None of that's true. That hasn't been the case. That's not true. Um, significant monetary, actually, the monetary investment is less. It's just a matter of convincing people to do it. The pipes are way more expensive than the green. Far more expensive. Um, and then this is always going to challenge people. People don't like this, right? When you upset the status quo, people get crappy, even if it could be better. They don't like it, you know, because they lose their power. So there's that. Those are the, the so basically, if you think of all the factors from adaptive governance, I didn't cover all of them, but we can get into that at some point. I can look it up. I can't remember it all off the top of my head. Um, <clears throat> but then these things in addition, okay? All right, so I probably should speed up, right? Um, okay. So. This is what I think, after eh, 30 years doing this stuff, <laughs> there's no magic bullet, blueprint, or recipe for success. Uh, I got attacked for this in Australia um, by a gentleman from CSIRO. He said, well, look, you can't scale this. I said, yeah, no kidding, but guess what? You're going to keep rolling out the same you know, blueprint you know, plans for every municipality or state across Australia, and you're probably going to end up with bad results. 
I mean, there's a host of examples throughout the course of you know, environmental ecosystem management that, that this is the case, right? I mean, context matters. And so law then sets the game, sorry, the stage, <laughs> and the rules of the game. And so it's not just the enabling legislation, it's that flexibility that those untapped, adaptive, and transformative capacities in the law, right? Then there's these things that, I think if you can get these three things, because I don't want to say blueprint or recipe, but these are like factors, guidance. These are loose, and they're real loose. It's not like I'm trying to lay out like 10, 20 things for you to do. And you do this recipe and then uh, with kumbaya by the fire, right? It's not going to happen, um, I don't think, but in my, based on my experience. Um, and so network, critical to do on the front end. What's a network? Well, we're in a network right now, right? And this is a network. Now, it might not exist after my talk ends or at the end of this day, but at this moment, we're in a network. And then leadership is critical, but it's not just like one leader, like maybe some of the literature. It's, it's in different organizations and at multiple scales, okay? Um, because that gives you redundancy. When things go bad, it's certain, you know, somebody leaves or somebody gets angry or their funding gets whatever, you have redundancy in that way, right? And then the champions, you find the champions when you, when you set your network up at the beginning. And what I mean by champions is the people that you, you can feel the people who are passionate and they care about the project, they have skin in the game because when the, thing, when the times get tough and the projects I've been involved with, there's been times when the project was completely dead, but then somebody who actually really cared and was totally vested and loved the work stepped up and kept the project going. So that's critical too. Like, like I say, there's no, you can't quantify this stuff. This is just things you have to try to, you know, try to do it at the front end, and, and you, hopefully it works, right? This is, again, what I think, based on multiple projects, not one. Um, so communication, regular chats and info sharing, you know, it seems silly, but it's true. Keeping in touch with people, calls, emails, meetings, community outreach, now we can do it virtually, right? Um, and then this, people laugh at this one too. It, it's true, happy hour, happy hour matters. You know, because why? You sit there and you meet people that you probably wouldn't ever really talk to. Maybe you have a drink or two and you get a little looser. And then, so you get to know the person a bit more and you establish trust through time. Right? But not always, it's not gonna be perfect, but maybe a little bit. You have a chance at it is the best way to say it. How about that? Okay, this gives you a chance. Um, all right, I don't need to say all this. Um, yeah, uh, okay, I basically said that. All right, and then now we're applying these same ideas in terms of like, you know, what Craig talked about and what I just talked about to a coral reef project. Um, uh, I've been running one in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and now we're going to move on to the Florida Keys. This is Lou Key in the Florida Keys. I wish the picture was better. Oh, well. It was the only publicly available one I could find. Anyway, so here's the U.S. Here's Florida. Okay. Here's the Keys. All right. So U.S., Florida, Everglades down here at the tip, okay? and then this is uh, Florida Bay, and then this is the Keys. So you see there's these different scales that have to be managed by these different agencies. In the U.S., we have federal, state, local, right? Well, guess what? Oftentimes, they don't even talk within the agencies, let alone across federal agencies. And then federal to state? <laughs> yeah, right. Hardly. So there's almost no coordination. There is some, depending on the project. I think your Platt project has some. My brain garden project in Cleveland did, but in my experience, a lot of times there's no communication at all. It's crazy uh, because you know they're very territorial about also their positions and their you know projects. I think there's that too, right? The old power relation stuff, right? That does matter. Um, and then, but the way then I think to foment this type of I guess cross scale governance is via these bridging organizations, but it's broader than that now. It's intermediaries because a network can do it too, an informal network. Okay. Yeah, and this is just why I think, I start thinking about this, like remember that old adage, I think like from like 50 years ago, it's like, what is it, uh, uh, think globally, act locally, locally? No, it's not, it's both. It's, you gotta think globally and locally, act locally and globally. You gotta go up and down. It's not either or. Uh, and there's some shameless self-promotion. This is a book we just put out recently on the, you know, panicky but the applied stuff, and then there's some papers. Um, yeah, okay, I think that's good for this one. We have time for questions? Tons of time? Okay. Okay. Do you want to ask questions now or no? That's fine. Yeah, sure.
Uh, okay, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm fall, I'm fall. So you're getting to like basically like a risk a basic like risk assessment in terms of like how can you No, they can't, because that's where the law comes in. I mean, because that's where the, the law comes in, right? Because, you know, with respect to, like, adaptive management, in the U.S. at least, it's really one of the, the strategies that can um, operate and pass legal scrutiny. And that's why we've kind of leaned towards it, um, because there's a whole host of other things that have been suggested. But, you know, it, it, these federal agencies, you're right, based on decisions that they make, they're going to be sued sometimes, right? Even if it seems like it's beneficial for the, you know, the broader good and things of this nature, they still might get sued, right? And, and in fact, the opposite sometimes, like the Flat River recovery program resulted from lawsuits from the water. And so it's not like the federal government or the free state does not just raise the funds. That's it. And pass legal scrutiny, and, and and can withstand legal scrutiny. Yeah, that's that. Um, that's great. Make sense. Resilience? Thank you. 
We're also going to be like, you know, covering super glue and duct tape. You're not going to get the same ecosystem services. <laughs> it's leaking. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, but it's a way to think about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, make a little bit of sense? I mean, because, okay, you got to think about it another way is like the difference is, okay, so the resilience of like, eh, no, I won't go there. Um, but yeah, there's other ways of looking at it, like Craig said, adaptive management, high controllability, meaning you can control your management intervention, right? And high uncertainty in like what's happening in the system, right? So then if you don't have, you can do adaptive management with other circumstances, but it's not necessarily going to work. But under those two circumstances, that's what it's designed for, for living with ecosystems, natural sources. And then for scenario planning, which is another thing Carl said, of, that's when you have low controllability and high uncertainty, right? And then so, that, but there's a, that's more limited because you can create multiple scenarios, but then once you decide upon the one, there's lots of them. So you're moving towards that one scenario. And it's the case that I've done, others, of course, have done, Ajahn has done, lots of people, and all of them did follow up for years. So it, it's a better case now. But it can still be difficult. So I'll, I'll zoom through this pretty quick so we don't just listen to me talk. But um, I guess interrupt me if you want clarity. So we're going to talk about scaling and resilience and panarchy, which is a model that underlies the idea of resilience. So hey, that did not change the screen, but not that screen. Huh? Resume slide so I got it. Okay, let's see if it works. Okay, yes. So scaling in, in, ecology, in ecology. So I read a lot about scaling in, in, in ecology and wildlife. Lots of people do scaling and they say we're doing multi-scale studies. And what they do is draw a bigger boundary around something and say it captures scale. Well, scale is both space, which is what bigger boundaries is, but it's also time. So ecological scaling has these two components. And we show these thermal diagrams to show scaling in complex systems. So the space-time diagram, and this here is the spatial or, or the scale domain of a given process or function. It has those temporal limits, 
and it has spatial length. And small things are fast, and large things are slow. So large-scale disturbances are generally infrequent. Small-scale disturbances are generally very frequent. So we can show, heuristically at least, a model of, say, a boreal forest, showing how scale structure changes with scale. So needles on a tree, small scale, and say we're talking pine trees, they have a resonance time on the tree of one to three years or so, and then they renew. Whereas the crown of a tree has, uh, is larger in space, and it persists for maybe decades, whereas a patch and a stand are even larger, and they exist for maybe centuries, and so on. And so we can show, this is simply a way of showing this idea that structure varies with scale, and that when you take a single system anywhere in the world, we could do this with social systems from individual up to um, state governments or something. Same kind of thing, show space-time domains. And, and that's important to the Panarchy story. So um, we can map out processes in, in space and time, um, mesoscale disturbances, etc. The point being that um, scale matters. And I did say I was going to talk about ecology here, so I got to talk about species. And I talk about species because all these original ideas not all of them, but the, this original panarchy idea was really driven by ecology. And let me just make the case for you that species live at different scales. You agree? Sounds simple. It's, it's a little hard to actually demonstrate. But let me give you an example. Well, John talked about the Everglades. Anybody know what this is? Close. It's an alligator hole. So this is driven by the, a process of alligators moving about to maintain a dry season, wet habitat. And these are a feature of the Everglades. They're small. One alligator is just fitting there. They're like this big. And a small-scale animal, let's think birds, a, a wren, a little small guy like this, is going to live its entire life around this alligator hole and interact with this fine-scale vegetative structure in this system. But in the exact same system, same spot, as we change scale, the pattern changes completely. So larger animals on the same landscape, say a jay, are no longer living their whole lifespan and interacting around vegetation, but they're interacting with this larger landscape and the matrix of alligator hole with tree islands. And different processes are driving that. Alligators are only driving this scale. This is being driven by something else. As we scale out any more, even more, a larger animal like a uh, osprey, say, or an eagle, is actually integrating across the entire landscape and looking at the landscape of ponds, tree islands, etc. Driven by so, so species change as you change scale. The structure changes, and the process responsible for the structure changes as you change scale. Droughts even broader scales, this is the same spot. Satellite image now, and you can see these red things. That's the signature of the slowest processes. This is a signature of the sea of water, the sea of grass in the Everglades. This is all sheet flow of water that makes these tree islands in the red get oriented with the flow of the water. So you change scale, you change process, you change structure. Because that structure um, provides opportunities for species, and species interact with ecological structure. As you change scale, the set of species changes as well. So again, if you're a little animal, like an ant, I'm the ant, fire ant guy, I did fire ant research for years. If you're an ant, you're interacting in this pine forest with this small scale structure of needles on the ground. Things like trees don't matter, they're background. So when you're at a single scale, slow things are background and smaller things are noise. So if you're on the same landscape and you're a little hominoid, my son, um, the pine needles are noise. He doesn't care. He's just stopping and crushing ants. It's meaningless to him. But the trees matter. You can't walk into them. 
he, I called him head injury boy as a child because he walked into a lot of things. So <laughs> that's the structure he has to watch out for. So again, scale, structure, they change together. And, and they're driven by process. And animals are, I don't, Pauling used to present the idea as the landscape was a template for the animal. And because the template was discontinuous, that is, the structure changed with scale, that it provided different opportunities for species. I think I think much differently. I think of animals as part of that interaction. When animals interact, sometimes they are the important processes. So you can't disengage the sort of template from the things that live on it. It's still interacting with species and structure together. So we use animal body size as a proxy for scale. That's easy in animal systems because size, body size, scales with almost everything important with species. Metabolic rate, energy intake, time to independence from home range, transportation, home range size, lifespan, everything. So size, a proxy for scale. You buy that? Size matters. <laughs> so, Buzz Holling, the paper that people said was either brilliant or insane, proposes textural discontinuity hypothesis. And it was simple as this. You remember I showed you a boreal forest stommel diagram. This is it with no labels. So it just shows a system with two, four, six, six different scales. And these are the space-time scales to name. Now, if his hypothesis is correct, if there's animals in this environment, and there is a body mass access here, what you would find, and this is we found true in hundreds of systems, is that unlike what ecologists thought completely up to about the year 2000, animal body mass distributions are not continuous. They're discontinuous. So what we find is there's a group of species with small body size that would correspond with that structure. Then there's a gap here. No body size, no species, no structure to interact with. And then there's another glut, is what Holland called them. Poor term. But, um, so in this system, we'd have six groupings of species separated by five discontinuities. So body mass distributions are discontinuous we can measure those discontinuities. Those discontinuities, presumably, are related to the scale of structure in the system. We've done literally thousands of these analyses and held that up. And as I said, the skeptics who didn't believe this have come around and agree. They may disagree with the mechanism, but I'm not sure if that's even true anymore either. It's, we usually run this analysis at an ecosystem level because the idea is that it's a self-organizing system that captures multiple scales. If you do it too small, you're only capturing one scale or something, you don't uncapture the dynamics of the system. I think, as uh, we were saying earlier, I think of the ecological systems as being spatially bounded dynamic things that can move, so it's spatial regimes instead of ecosystems, perhaps. So I'd apply this for self-similar large Yeah, the, the discontinuity separates scales of structure in the system. So that you would have in most systems a discontinuous distribution of species, and those the number of discontinuities or groupings would relate to the structure in the system. Some systems, like our boil or our rainforest, really structurally complex. A prairie, not structurally complex. So you're going to have a difference. So in fact, this kind of scaling one can actually provide a signature of systems and reveal um, something about them, the scales, the processes, how complex they are, how many scales there are in the system, etc. So resilience, we talked about ability to, to keep within a, a, a given ecological state and measure. And it's a cross-scale measure. So what I wanted to do is talk really, really briefly about the cross-scale resilience model and then canopy that underlies it. Um, model synthesis. So for years, ecologists have tried to argue 
that biodiversity matters, right? And, and usually they couch that in terms of biodiversity stability, but what you could also couch it as biodiversity resilience, really, because we don't believe in the stability per se. And, and there are really competing models about how the bio, why does biodiversity matter? The main, I won't go into all of them, but you know, coming back from Darwin uh, all the way to quite re recently, one that's very, um, people have heard a lot about is this one. And this was the Paul Ehrlich's model. And, and it got a lot of press in the 90s, because remember in the 90s, biodiversity was just coming into prominence. E.O. Wilson and others were talking about the importance of biodiversity, et cetera. And early forward in this model, of why does biodiversity matter? We had to have some argument about species loss and preventing it. And the model he put forward was the rivets model. So what he said was that ecological systems are like airplanes. And animals in the system, the biodiversity, are like the rivets that hold the system together. And you can lose a rivet, or two rivets, or ten rivets. But at some point, you're going to lose that critical risk. See, there's all these redundancies. You notice how stability or resilience in their model has them so it's flattened. So all that to the right is redundancy. So it's only when you start losing too many species and that redundancy is lost that the airplane or the ecological system collapses. That was a good model, easy for people to understand, easy to communicate. Oh no, the airplane's going to crash. All these models are missing one critical element. You know what that is? You got it. <laughs> but you're right. It is scale. So these models are missing scale, right? And so all these models are, are posited, predicated on the, on the idea that species do things. They have functions. And those functions are important to stability and resilience. But think of a function like seed dispersal. That's a critically important function in ecological systems. It's done by ants, done by birds, done by monkeys, done by elephants. The scale of those animals is extremely difficult. So scaling has to be incorporated into these models. And we thought Ehrlich's model and some of these others were really dangerous. Because what it says to policymakers is that most species are redundant. We can lose them. We just gotta not lose the critical one or too many. And I thought that was a really dangerous method. So we posited a different model, and there is a whole lot of work that went into it, which I'm totally excluding. And I'm just jumping to the model. So the model we presented was relating biodiversity to resilience, if you will sort of comes to this. Think of one size class. Remember, body size, scale. So you might have a group of you know, 12 species with similar body size, a, a lack of species of bigger body size, and then a group of species of even greater body size. So this is just one group of species. What we find, and, and this was posited, but then um, sustained with data and empirical analyses, is that within a scale, lump of species, a grouping of species of the same body size, you tend to have a diversity of functions. There is some invertation, that means functional overlap, not everything's unique, and there is some redundancy in most systems. But in general, a redundancy or a diversity of function within scale, and across scales, a redundancy of function. But scale comes in. We use the term redundancy of function across scales, knowing though that that's a misnomer. You're not redundant if the um, action is happening at a different scale. Something dispersed in seeds at small scale is going to lead to a greatly different structure in a system than if the seed dispersal is done at large scale. And in this paper, we included a model of, of um, dispersal by um, seed dispersing animals, large and small, from the Uganda forest. You find indeed you lose the scale of function totally change the structure of the system. Anyways, we've done a ton of assessment on this model, and it seems to hold. So the model in total looks like this. Within a scale, diversity, across scale, redundancy, except that it's across scale, so it's not truly 
redundant. It's cross scale. I'll give you an example as a way to explain this. Remember, I showed a stall, a stall of boreal forest structure changing? So here it is. Let's just say there's four scales of structure. There's going to be four groupings of animal body mass. And as an example, one of the big challenges in, in, in this leads, this is derived from this command and control attempt in the boreal forest to manage for um, forest production beyond all else, but there's spruce budworm male outbreaks in the boreal forest. Normally, spruce budworm is a small scale. It's a lap larvae, and it eats needles. And so usually, it's just a single larvae. It's little, it lives in its needle, and it's preyed upon by small birds. But every once in a while, because of our forest policies and other reasons, there's this increasing forest volume. And as the forest volume increases, predators can't keep up with these just with the amount of volume that's coming up in the forest, <coughs> and spruce budworm begin to outbreak in the higher branches of trees. When that happens, it's an aggregated larger scale resource. And what we see is larger predatory birds start to use the resource at that point. And because they're larger birds, they come in for longer distances as well. So you, and as it scales up, entire crowns and then entire forests are infested by budworm. By the time the uh, in infestation is really scaled up, you got basically every insect-eating, predaceous bird in the system, even the largest ones, exploiting this resource. So it's a pretty robust control in sort of contagious outbreaks, which are pest infestations, have the spatial contagion aspect to it. So that's the general model. Yes. Yes. Then you, then, then you may, let's say you lose this. Normal function of the system, you wouldn't notice it. But when a perturbation scales up, and then you're missing that level of control, that function, then it becomes apparent. So yeah, you can lose the scale and not have an impact for decades. But when the right disturbance comes, the loss of resilience will be obvious in the collapse. Possibly. I mean, it is hierarchical, right? And the larger scale always subsumes the smaller scale. I guess one different in the, difference in the panarchy model I'm about to show is panarchy also really accounts for dynamics in the other direction. That small scale processes can scale up and actually lead to the destruction of the system. Budworm are an example of that. Spruce budworm outbreaks can destroy, you know, hundreds of thousands of kilometers. Just like in the U.S. right now, we have um, pine bark beetles leading to just decimation, decimation of the forests in western, in the Rocky Mountains of the U.S. Small scale disturbances scaled up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I'm not sure specifically what you mean, but yeah, I think there's a lot of implications in, in related to policy and the scale of implementation and, and one of the challenges we have with long policies that lack of scaling it often. There just to, to show you um, where am I? So I'm gonna preface here. So the idea of a panarchy is this idea of adaptive cycles occurring at every scale. So this Stommel diagram shows the boreal forest with six scales of structure. So this schematic of a panarchy should have six scales. It doesn't have three just because I put it on here for fun. <laughs> I'll explain it a little better. But before I, I do so, I think I explained the textural discontinuity hypothesis that the scale structure 
will be manifest in the discontinuous distribution of animal body masses. What we've also found is the question is, are these things real or what is the mechanism for it? So people in physics and other domains have posited that there's increased variance at scale breaks. So these transitions between scales and systems really represent scale breaks. There should be this increased variance at these scale breaks. Think of phase transitions as water turns into gas. There's this period where it's really some water, some gas, and things, you know, much variability. And it had never been demonstrated for ecological systems. Now, we took this kind of body mass data and looked at the species at the edge of these scale breaks to see if there's anything going on. And what we found is that there's a profile of things going on ecologically. So nomadic species tend to be right at those scale breaks. And nomadic species exploit highly variable resources, and they do it by moving in space and time. Migrant species. So we found that species that migrate from um, eastern North America are those that are at the edge of these body mass distributions. The ones that are in the interior of the body mass distributions leave. And that's the idea, again, that at the edge of these scale transitions, resources are more variable. So maybe in the summer there's a lot and you can exploit them, but you leave in the winter. We also find that invasive species in many systems and extinctions occur right at those scale breaks. So if you look at a system like the Everglades that had 50% of its species endangered and 50% non-native, that, all that huge change in the ecological system doesn't change that discontinuous structure. You'd think if you had that much turnover that you would just wipe out that structure. But all the change is happening at those scale breaks. And the structure stays because the system hasn't collapsed yet. And then population variability. We found that both variability and abundance, both in space and time, is heightened at those species at those scale breaks. So all this is meant to simply make the case that in ecology, we're fairly, at least some of us, are fairly confident that the world is scale. Body mass distributions, but other variables too, like firm sizes and cities, can be analyzed in the same way. They're discontinuous, and those discontinuities represent scale breaks, and that the stuff in between the scale breaks represent things that operate at the same or a similar scale. Even if this is all wrong, we found that it's really, if we do analyses like a community assembly, talking about Humpty Dumpty effect, or other analyses like this, that they're improved by analyzing as if these scale breaks are real. So the fact that these metrics of like priority effect, I know you're not community ecologists, you have to take my word on this, that these things are actually improved when you scale the analysis like this. So maybe the mechanisms and our ideas are all wrong, but there's some real benefit no matter what of analyzing species in a way that accounts for a scale. So species of a similar body size more things, including social ecological systems of a similar size, are going to interact in a similar way. Simple as that. So what's the significance of some of this variability stuff? Well, things like nomadism are fairly poorly understood. And this model explains it. Um, and you can use this increased variability to actually identify those scale breaks. So you don't need the body mass, look at heightened variability, and that indicates a break in the data. And perhaps it provides interesting insight. It also helps feed into the model of panarchy. And so here's a model of panarchy. This is happening, this is a panarchy model, at one scale. So think again of that Stommel diagram with six scales shown. This is just one of those scales. And it's as an example, you all understand succession, right, in ecology? How, like, you know, the forest fire comes, the forest is killed, and then there's successional processes, it regrows and matures, and then it happens again. In many ways, that's what this is. You have this period, you have a mature forest, and when it's a mature forest, it's long-lived generally, and it's relatively ha-ha stable, I laugh, but it is relatively stable. 
capital is locked up, it's there. But it's a brittle system at that point and just vulnerable to collapse. And so inevitably, you go through this release, could it be a forest fire in the forest or, or disturbance or landslide, rapid release of all that capital and it's happening from SDS as well. Then you have this reorganization stage that's really fast. This is an assembly process. So who gets there and who assembles matters. And most of the time, almost always, because of everything present, the system's just going to reset the same way. So you lose a spruce fir forest to fire. You get back spruce fir forest. But sometimes during this reorganization stage, that's when a completely alternative stable state emerges. And one idea I want to get across that's really important is resilience, is that we can think of resilience at multiple scales. So this is the smallest scale of the system, say, we're answer interaction. It still has a level of resilience and can still collapse. And the collapse of the small scale, like a pond, does not affect the greater landscape, right? And you can have these resilience dynamics occurring at multiple scales. The only time, and it's good that Ajahn used that term, death of a thousand cuts, is that we have lots of same, same size things, small scale synchronizing to collapse. That's when you can affect the system itself. Panarchy then, so again, the adaptive cycle is supposed to be happening at one scale, but a panarchy is multiple scales. So what panarchy is, is really just a nested set of adaptive cycles. At each scale, these dynamics are going on. And you can think of resilience as occurring at each scale, but if resilience collapses at the upper scale of the system, it's going to collapse everything below it. But if you collapse, say, a pond, it's not going to collapse, say, the Dutch ecosystem. It's just going to collapse that pond. If the Dutch ecosystem collapses, the pond's going to have problems. So it's just a, a way of scaling. And one real difference um, between the sort of hierarchy theory is the idea that of revolt, that, the, that small scale changes, if they're in synchrony, can affect the entire system. And the hierarchy theory is pretty fully top down only. So a little more dynamic in that sense in accounting for both top down and bottom up effects in systems. But I think it's really hard for most people to sort of think of the scaling idea in resilience, and that resilience is a concept that actually occurs at multiple scales. You can think of it at multiple scales. The dynamics and systems are going on multiple scales. There's things going on, you know, at the top level, it's an ecosystem. When you get down here, there's lots of different systems, right? And they're all in different phases of the adaptive cycle, so dynamics. So if, if you want to transform it to change, at least in our language, so let's just look at the system level. What you would do is you had a system that was undesirable, and it's up in this cave state. Let's say it's a boreal forest, but we don't want boreal forest anymore. You purposely erode resilience, collapse the system, and during this reorganization phase, human agency helps nudge the system to an alternative desirable state. So the idea is you collapse the system and you foster transformation to a more desirable state. Well, yes, except that we, um, the, the, the management going on is not large enough to actually allow natural dynamics to occur. So it's purely coerced. That it's it's human driven, human driven. So a transformation is a human driven process. It, it could be at you know, any scale you want, All right? And so if you want to transform a lake, eutrophic lake, you can you have a reduced the resilience of the algae dominated state and then allow a clear state to come through, through 
purposeful human interaction of probably removing phosphorus in that case in a big way. But you can also do it at a larger scale. So I think all of these ideas of transformation, resilience, et cetera, are, can occur at multiple scales. And we were talking during lunch about planetary boundaries. That's simply applying these ideas to a very large scale of the universe. So you can think of all these things at multiple scales, including transformative processes. Or, or social ecological, it applies to, to systems of people in nature as well. Intervention. And then, of course, we quick. Yes. It is Then you, you have a whole problem of, of governance scales not corresponding yeah, right. with SES scales. Like so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a totally different problem. It's a yeah. big one. Yeah. yeah. Just to drive this home a bit, I won't, I won't talk about that. So, again, back to those um, original photographs, we think that each one of these occurring at a different scale, different processes, different adaptive cycles. At some point, this alligator is going to die. This is going to fill in some other alligators going to start a new alligator hole somewhere else and small scale renewal occurs and at larger largest scale we have now Luca and other things predating the other bite and it's going to collapse the whole system eventually ecologists are you know dismal science and just the final example this is an boreal forest showing the scales of structure in, in the system and how a panoply an adaptive cycle that correspond with each scale, and then a canopy is just this nested adaptive cycle. And it sort of drives home the point that interventions, management, etc., need to account for scale and be scale specific. And these dynamics are presumably happening at each scale. There's um, then, you know, panarchy got received by the scientific community the same way resilience did in 1973. People thought it was kind of nuts. Panarchy's now been out for 25 years, and I, you know, certainly sort of literature citation and updates are exploding. And I'd say it's a, the same kind of idea. Science is conservative. It takes ideas for takes time for new ideas to come in. And I think panarchy. I put panarchy in the National Science Foundation proposals and had them funded, so that shows some acceptance to. NSF is actually very conservative, despite what they like to say. So that is the end of sort of a panarchy, and I think Ajahn's going to talk about sort of some example of panarchy. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, oops, hold on, let me come on.
Okay, can you guys hear me? I guess here we can hear fine. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so what he just showed you, I'm probably is you know. I don't know if, if you were able to understand a lot of it. Hopefully some you did because it was pretty heavy, you know, really uh, heavy in the ecology and also like a really high-end ecology, okay? Um, is this working? Let's see. Okay, good. Okay, so what I'm going to tell to you about now is one way of looking at or using Panarchy within the context of an actual project, um, you know, an application of these, these ideas. <clears throat> Um, within an urban setting. So uh, let's do that. And in this case, it's a transformation from small scales, and I'll show you. All right, there's the definition. Um, and as I said, that we're really trying to focus here because I've seen lots of definitions out there, okay? Um, and a lot of them really didn't make much sense, even in the Resilience Alliance, um, some of the, which was shocking. We really dug down to some of this stuff. Um, so what we felt was necessary is to get the underpinnings, like, you know, basically the, the, your, your foundation of your house, right? Which if you're dealing with these, you know, living systems, these linked systems of humans and nature, you know, so if you're operating in a city or anything, any, any type of arrangement where there's that, you know, biophysical element, you need to have your underpinnings right. And then you build everything else off of that. Because if you don't have the foundation right, then the house will collapse eventually, or it's just BS. So, okay, so there's that. Um, okay, so this one revolves around, this story revolves around, or this case study revolves around green infrastructure. Um, uh, okay, what is that? It's, it's rain gardens, it's constructed wetlands, it's uh, urban prairies, it's um, uh, urban agriculture, it's, uh, what else? Trees. Trees can be, you know, just trees, parks. There's more, but you get the idea. So, in particular, the focus from this perspective, from the U.S. Environment Protection Agency, this is the, the agency I work for, um, we were geared around, I, I showed you the stormwater issue earlier. You weren't here, but anyway, there was a stormwater issue with respect to combined sewer overflows. You have these combined sewers, so you have raw sewage, chemicals, oil, you know, whatever. Any crud off the streets, the sidewalks, the roofs, flows out untreated into waterways. It's becoming a major issue, uh, public health and environmental issue. <clears throat> so. These things can do these direct benefits, right? They can reduce runoff volume, um, increase detention capacity, and restore the hydrologic cycle. So what this means basically is you just keep water out of the sewers, so you don't have those massive plumes, and uh, you know uh, of the, all that untreated nastiness into your water bodies. And then they have the ancillary benefits, which you probably already know anyway. Um, some you folks probably are aware of this stuff. But there's aesthetics, they look good, you know, recreational opportunities, pollinators, there's a whole host of other things, but these are just some of them. Um, and then, so this is a rain garden in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, in the United States. I showed you that, where that is earlier. <clears throat> and so, anyway, I think it's important to see these sorts of things, just so you can get the underlying structure. This is like green space, right? And then there's like a walking and a uh, bike trail up here. And then, you know, so it's basically, it's dug out with some soils that are good for infiltrating water and also growing the plants, which they're not blooming yet, but they do eventually. Um, uh, these guys bloom and attract uh, pollinators, beneficial arthropods. My entomologist friends told me I was doing it wrong. I forgot. Beneficial arthropods. Okay. So this is important. This is a curb cut. So like, you know, when you, you have a curb, right, next to a street, you cut the curb and the water comes into the rain garden. It doesn't go into the sewer, the combined sewer, so therefore that keeps the water out of the sewer. It goes here, it infiltrates more slowly, grows the plants. You get the idea, right? Okay, so originally what this project started at was adaptive management, you know, an adaptive management plan of rain gardens, right? <clears throat> and then through time, it, well, and then the governance component 
was, was what framed that, right? And then so these were the factors that were like, you know, primary factors for adaptive governance, at least, you know, the, there, there's different types of adaptive governance out there, which is also fun, right? There's different tracks. And the one we were following was from Folky et al. from 05, uh, 2005. And so, as I showed you earlier, there was things in that particular conception that I thought were really weak. And so I've kind of adapted things, you know, it's really weak on the wall, I mean, which I think is fatal. Quite honestly, I mean, I, and I think a lot of the social scientists don't agree, but they don't really think about it in terms of like, how are you going to put this stuff in the ground? Or, or not uh, put this stuff in the ground, but how are you going to do these things on the ground? How are you going to apply these ideas, right? Or how are you going to do a lot of applica application? And I'm really very much focused on that because of where I sit with my, you know, my position, you see? Um, and then in intermediaries, I talked about that already. And then the, the matching organizations. The panarchy thing is kind of weird with you know, the species, but that gives you the underpinnings of where that comes from, okay? But it's also more so, it's an understanding that there's multiple scales, right? That define Earth. Um, okay, I did this already. So you, anyways, vacant lots for, <laughs> so vacant lots used to put green infrastructure. I won't go through the whole thing again, anyway, because they did it. Um, anyway, so this is what we got. This is, you know, I don't know if this is shocking for, for you folks, but it, it was, it's for America, it's shocking. This, this area, my study area was, you know, like 10 blocks, so around 400 lots, and half of them were vacant, meaning that this entire neighborhood had collapsed, essentially, right? It was, and so these, these were people's homes, right? And so they just were abandoned. So these are like, there's two there at least that were gone now, they're vacant lots. That one's still occupied. And it was, I mean, it's unbelievable to see it. It was really just mind blowing. And so this is what you're left with. And uh, yeah, sorry, I'm a, I can't metric. <laughs> so it's 35 feet and 125 feet in length. Can you translate that? To, to English? And, uh, <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay, it's not very big. You can see it's not too big. <laughs> so, but this is the raw material um, for urban green transformation in Cleveland, Ohio, and a lot of American cities that are, are suffering this uh, collapse. Right, post-industrial collapse, and there's a lot of American cities that have experienced this. Particularly, after it was already happening in the mortgage crash. It's, I mean, it's just non-linear changes. Boom, unbelievable. Okay, so what do we do with this project? Well, we collected baseline data, you know, on soils and hydrologic data, pollinators, the beneficial arthropods, and then we have control sites and treatment sites. And so, what does that mean? With the treatment sites, we just put GI into the vacant lots, and in this case. Ours was really focused on rain gardens. There's, there was a whole bunch of other stuff. I'll get to that. There was a whole bunch of other stuff going on, too. Um, uh, so <clears throat> it's important to note here, I think this is, maybe it's not as big of a deal uh, from a Dutch perspective, but definitely from an American perspective. The federal agencies, you know, like EPA or the Fish and Wildlife Service, they, they operate under, or historically, under a command and control paradigm. You, does everybody know what that means? Okay, with respect to like endangered species, say there's endangered species on your land or you want to try to develop there, it's like, no, you will not develop that area. It's just, that's it, there's no rule. And if you do not do that, there are gonna be civil and potentially criminal penalties, command and control. That's really unpopular in the US um, because the US and people in particular in the areas where a lot of that was happening, they hate it. I mean, there was stuff happening, I'll just do a quick aside. There was 30 Panthers left, Florida Panthers back in the mid, you know, 90s when I was living down there doing my sea turtle research, there was a sign that somebody had shot the 30 and wrote 29 because they hated it because it restricted what they could do with their land. And there was also like, you know, restrictions on, I'd found sea turtles dead, you know, just bullets in their heads, uh, manatees with just bullets in their heads. Because why? These folks knew that as soon as they got rid of these animals, there was no regulation. Then they could go back and do what they wanted. They wouldn't have these, all these rules. So anyway, <laughs> that kind of gives you an idea. The command and control, it, it worked really well for many, many years, but then it got to a point where it was causing these undesirable consequences, like, you know, turtles and manatees with bullets in their heads. Um, so this project in particular, um, Engage was very much geared around, we're not gonna do this type of, you know, lay it on you, you're gonna do it. We wanted to engage. And that was also that was a big part of me thinking that way because I experienced all that is that we're going to engage at lower scales. You know, the Cleveland Botanical Garden is just an NGO in that area. A critical player in this project. The Sewer District, that's what that means, that acronym. Um, and so they're local in Cleveland. And there was, you know, another, like, small NGO 
I mean, individual citizens, universities, other federal agencies, um, probably missing somebody, but you get the idea. I mean, we were trying to engage multiple organizations and individuals at multiple scales because my, I'd already thought that this was the way to go because it just was not, you know, what I'd seen in the, in the past and also from the literature is that this command and control paradigm was starting to really uh, wear out its welcome, so to speak. Does that make sense? You know, in terms of like the types of outcomes you could get from it. So we engaged these partners at lower scales, smaller scales, the city of Cleveland, right? An NGO, the sewer district. So they're the ones who actually put the rain gardens into the vacant lots, right? And then we selected plants for provisioning of, you know, different services like, you know, water infiltration, attracting the, the arthropods, the beneficial arthropods. Then Ohio State University, <clears throat> they planted an additional 30 vacant lots in, you know, in our study area. Um, with what it was basically, they didn't do, do rain gardens. They just basically did a little bit of site prep and put in uh, plants that had good root systems for infiltrating water and then attracting pollinators. Okay. So, okay, we also did community engagement because I thought this was really important because there's, like I said, this hostility to the American public to federal agencies. I mean, we're hated. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, I'll give you an example back in the day with my sea turtle work. I was uh, using, um, you know, mullet, which is a type of fish to catch raccoons. And this fish company and this guy, this, he was a real character. He'd been in federal prison for uh, running cocaine. And so he, he goes, hey, and so I was in a federal vehicle, U.S. government vehicle. And he's like, hey, what are you doing with that mullet out there? And I was like, oh, well, you know, we're out there, you know, we're going to um, get rid of the, you know, some of the raccoons so we can make more sea turtles so we can get rid of the net ban. There was this ban on fishermen, right? They didn't like that either, right? And so he was so hostile to me. I mean, he absolutely hated me. And then I told him I was a grad student at the University of Florida, and he liked me. It was just that shift in like who I was affiliated with and a shift in like in scale. That's what I thought back in the, at that time. So community engagement, uh, even back then, I felt was incredibly important. I know lots of people think that anyway, but that's just my personal experience. My first one where it just like hit me as a, wow, I can't believe this. I didn't expect to be received like this by this person. And just because now he knows I'm affiliated with something more local and that he relates to, He's actually okay towards me. It's anyway, so there was that subtle shift, right? So, but also there's trade-offs between, even when you're engaging the citizens, what do they want? You know, maybe they like something that looks like this. We give them a different sets of plants, how they look, blah, blah. So then we, we have trade-offs with that, right? So we, and we did that because we want them to stay engaged and then they might chop the plants down just to be, you know, vindictive because that really, it, I don't know if the Dutch are like that, but the Americans are. <laughs> They'll just do it just to be like, oh yeah, you know what? I don't like that. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah. Oh, it's on, uh, yeah, land bank land, so it's public land. Yeah, it had become public land through time because it just been, had been abandoned. It was worth nothing, right? So it was worth nothing. So these land banks, NGOs in the city of Cleveland took the, took the land over. And so it's, yeah, what the, the only trick here is, and I'll show you, is that there are different types of rain gardens. Well, there's more to it than that, but there's these, the, the botanical garden did these more simplistic ones. Yeah, it's just basically like dug out with some soils that are good for the, the, the plants. Very basic, but these had engineering specifications. And then these were much more uh, expensive, but, and they ended up looking a lot better, but they're really expensive. This, the sewer district did these, and, but they had landscape architects, you know, and that gets expensive. It looks, looks cool, but it looks nicer but it gets a lot more expensive, but they were both had engineering specifications. They both perform basically the same. So why would you, and the aesthetics, yeah, is, but is the, is the cost worth it for the aesthetics? That's something, that's a trade-off, right? Uh, the sewer district or the botanical garden or the, 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 the NGO, yeah, yeah. And then, okay, so here's the study site. Um, this is the study area. And so the orange, sorry, the yellow ones and the green ones, you can't, the trees obscure them, but you can see them nested in there, right? Yeah, those are like the treatments. And then the oranges are the controls. Then you have these red triangles. These are groundwater wells. Um, then you have, this is all monitoring infrastructure, okay? Then you have weather stations here and here. Um, then in the individual lots, we had uh, soil moisture monitoring. And then those cuts I showed you, those curb cut things, right? There's these flumes that measure water flow into there too, right? And then we had, in pipe monitoring above and below the study site. So the pipes flow this way, right? And then you have to this big pipe, and so above and below. So what you see there then is we've got this you know, incredible monitoring uh, 
capacity, you know, the inf infrastructure, right? So it's just, it gives us capacity for adaptation or tra and or transformation, right? Depending on the, the circumstances of w which direction we're gonna go with things. Um, the negative for this particular project was I was doing it from afar. Um, I was for, this was pre-COVID. It was ended in 2019, right? You know, as uh, a code just about before COVID came, right? Um, so this, I was four hours by car from Cleveland. And so I'm getting up there four or five times a year. It wasn't enough. I mean, I'm proud of the way it, it turned out, but I really think if that's a lesson I think that I would share with people. If you can do it in more in a local locality, I, I think it's better. Um, even though I had all this engagement with all these different um, leaders, which I described briefly before, at multiple, in multiple organizations and at multiple scales, and we maintained communication, we were on top of things. I still feel that that's, a, that's an impediment. Distance ain't your friend. How about that? So here's a rain garden. There's some flowers growing. One of my old postdocs. And then this is a bigger one. This is you know, a larger feature. Um, you know, ended up being really beautiful. I wanted to show you like this so you could kind of get the lay of the land sort of. And then also this is a walking trail back here and a hiking trail. Ends up being a lovely amenity for the neighborhood. And then you can even see like, I mean, the only way I can express this, I, try, I talked to economists to try to figure out how to quantify some of these changes. There was no real good way to do it with the short term that we had. So it's like, well, I guess let's have to show up pictures. In terms of, you started this, this really like, you know, crime, depressing as hell, trash, abandoned buildings. And then next thing you know, you have like, at least it's green space and you start having people make colorful murals, things like this. And you think, oh, that's kind of silly. No, it's not. It really, the vibe, the whole place had come, fundamentally changed in terms of what was happening. The crime rates went down, it was unbelievable, right? So it went from, like, I should do this earlier, again, so I'm gonna bring it back, and then boom, same spot, right? You already saw it earlier, so I won't do it again. But then, like, you get other things. There was, <clears throat> beyond our project, and this is important to note, <clears throat> there were a lot of other entities in Cleveland not affiliated with us, but kind of loosely, but not, we didn't communicate it at all, really. They were doing other forms of green transformation stuff, right? Like stuff like these, uh, streetscapes with like permeable pay pavement, things like this, and then um, features like this, which were larger, you know, in nature, looks really nice, you know, and this was in like really bad neighbor, you know, tough neighborhoods. Um, that I showed you before, this is an urban prairie, you know, so then you end up having these wildlife corridors, and then, you know, like, uh, I, I think these are bat bird and bat houses, I can't remember, but they're whatever, there's birds, there's birds and bats. <laughs> they were both, I saw them. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so stuff like this, you know, so it just, and this was happening throughout, so it's important to note that it wasn't just what I showed you, our study area, that was that, right, but we had that specific focus on stormwater, right, and keeping it out of sewers. And the other things we were happy about, but the others were doing like primarily, urban, like there were some groups who were doing primarily urban agriculture, so that huge space I showed you, this, with all these vacant lots, it's happening throughout the city, so it's like this percolation effect, and you know, eventually it started getting to some type of contagion. Here, what we got to with our project was this, parcel scale, vacant lot, individual vacant lots, and then neighborhood scale, which is about 400 you know, lots total, but half of them were vacant. We didn't do, we only did, you know, so many, but we were able to link that stuff in there to see what, you know, level we could get to, to, to effectuate some form of change, some form of transformation. And by transformation, fundamental change in structure and processes, okay? So with respect to our project, the water and sewer project, you're changing the structure. Okay, what's the structure here? It's the sewer, it's the, the water and sewer infrastructure, changing from gray pipes, which are just in the ground, everybody knows what that is, right? To this green options, these green, this green infrastructure that was actually then put into the ground, okay? And then, so what's the process? And our goal here was to effectuate the hydrologic cycle, right? Remove water out of the, the sewers um, and restore the hydrologic cycle. Okay, so look, then let me say that again. So it's, we got here and then we scaled up to here, let me show you. And then, look, this, to get to this scale, I mean, it's still ongoing. It, it would take decades, I think, um, but it's still happening. There was, that, there was that level of contagion that once you could see, that finally get things in the ground. And let me tell you, it was not easy. It took years to get the, the stuff in the ground um, because there was all these institutional and organizational hurdles to overcome, right? We're working in the city, like the jurisdictions of like uh, different city councilmen, and <laughs> council persons, and then, you know, the mayor's office. And then you know, local codes, zoning codes. I mean, you know, think about it. As lawyers, this, these are the types of things that you can relate to. It became very tricky, but now that that process has been navigated, we have a better understanding of what it takes to get it done. You know, 
it's still happening. I mean, now our part in terms of like we're not no longer part of it. That's that's one of the bad sides. The EPA we we typically get cut off after four years. We are, we're able to keep this one going for eight or nine years. We had to beg and plead. I mean, because there's the political cycle. I mean, I won't go. I, we're live, right? I'm not going to speak about exactly what that means, but I think we all understand. When there's a political cycle, things change. <laughs> Priorities change. So. <laughs> This will happen in, in many spots where you started having these community gardens. We didn't do community gardens, but guess what? Others, it was happening all around the city. There was this, this, this contagion, this percolation of this type of thing happening. Once people started seeing it in certain spots, it was actually in the ground. It was actually working, not flooding their basements or bringing mosquitoes or like, you know, bringing more raccoons. People were like, I was going to bring more raccoons around my house. It's like, no. <laughs> so, but we had to show it. We had to prove it to them, you know, because this was, that's what I mean by when you say like risk, you know, you're, risk tolerance so this, for this type of thing, right? There was initially. Now, it's just, we've kind of established it, right? So and this is fantasy land to do green at all, right? It's not gonna happen. Yeah, hold up, let me, can I, oh, okay, go ahead. I just think, you know, you, um, you have the science monitor and water off, and it's water is reduced? Yes, yeah, but only at small scales. We didn't scale up to like what could have effectuated massive change for the lake because we didn't get that far. But I think over time, that's my, my point being, is that over time, you, but you'd have to get to a larger you know, set of, not the small set that we were able to get to, but there was others who were doing things too, right? So through time, yes, absolutely, I think you can. And the models show that, I know models, you and I are the same way, you know, they're, 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 all, they're all wrong, some are useful, right? But the modeling data showed that, yeah, if you could get to, not all, you didn't even need to get to all of this, I can't remember the percentage. You should probably have that in the talk, but. Yeah, can it help? Sure, because you think about like green, the green options, it reduces yeah. urban heat, islands, and you know, also yeah, a sense of community, people around the community guards, people really, you know, collected around us, right? Yeah, the, yeah, it's pretty, looks nice, you know, you can even have, you know, some people were putting up you know, beehives because they were attracting more pollinators. Yeah. But they need... Yeah, you have to. Yeah, you have to have that. The, the, the maintenance, that's a massive factor. You brought up that point. Maintenance, yeah, and then you did too. And then the other is monitoring, you know, through time. And now, do I know all these other ones are doing that type of stuff? I, I can't say that. But I do know those things are starting to ha they were happening, that, you know, in different ways. I think I showed some of it, but I mean, like for ours, we got to soils at lot, small scale, like I said, but at least we got to that. And it showed that, because really when we started this, the green infrastructure, this whole like rain was in the US was not gonna be used as a large scale way of dealing with some of the problems, like water quality problems that I'm describing. And a lot of cities in the US have this issue, these combined sewers. But now it's, it's we've demonstrated in a bunch of different cities. So it's starting to, I mean, I have to say that it has been stunted somewhat, so I have to be honest, because of, again, political cycle. Yeah. So there's that. But, it is, but it's not dead, you see. I think they still will have the capacity because we've demonstrated, hey, look, we can do it. It's cheaper. And it's way, you know, there's all sorts of other things that you get from it, right? Yeah, I think that that's a fair point. Or unless you have massive amounts of green space already that you could you could use to, yeah, that, that's a fair point. Or you can do other things that like some people are like, you know, with green roofs and other ways to try to, but it, it depends. I mean. So it is worth noting that, you know, the EPA kind of also used the city of Omaha, Nebraska, to do some of the things that they were doing I forgot about that. Yeah, that's that's yeah. 
Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, because I actually went to Omaha with Bill to do, we, we sampled, and there weren't any. It was just parks. We were sampling in parks, yeah. This, the, this guy Schuster, who I, well, I acknowledge him, he, used to, he was the guru behind this. He was the soil scientist, green infrastructure guy. I brought the other things, you know, the resilience, adaptive management, adaptive governance, the panarchy. And he was probably just like sitting there like, what? What, 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 are, you doing, what are you doing to me? <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so you get the idea. So we were able to do it lot, neighborhood, lot, neighborhood for some of these things. This one, it didn't happen. And <laughs> this is another issue in terms of like, okay, how is that possible, right? Well, I'll tell you what, it was a master's student and she, we, it took us too long to get the rain guards in the ground. And so she sampled right after we had planted. They didn't start blooming yet, but she had to do her sampling then because that's when her field season was. So anyway, it's just, you know, stuff like that. There's always going to be something. Okay, so yeah, you want to go back? Strict dead. The deadline for us is, honestly, it's, it's really politically determined. So we operate on four-year cycles, right? That, I mean, we were able to keep this one going because there was, you know, a president won two cycles, right? One, two back-to-back -back presidencies. So that's an eight-year, we kept it going nine because it, it was still able to limp it into the next administration. But then they really de-emphasized, at least from the federal level, for this particular agency I work for. But it's that, that doesn't mean anything, quite honestly, I don't think. Because there's so much other stuff happening in the U.S. from you know, sewer districts, NGOs, universities, community organizations. I mean, yeah, it's, it's okay. I think that, that, that you know, the, the, the genie is out of the bottle, so to speak, right? I mean, it already was, but not to this type of, you know, scale, right? So, um, all right, I, I think I said this stuff before. I'm not going to do it again. Okay, good. So, acknowledgments. Um, these are some key players, some of my former postdocs and where they are now. Yeah. Does that make sense? Kind of. <laughs> so you, hopefully you were able to get, you know, from Craig, I know it's, it's a, you know, the, the species, the panarchy, that's, I know for a bunch of lawyers, that's tough, right? But hopefully he was able to, it, you know, and then in a, now in an applied way, right? We're dealing with the species, humans. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's not the same thing. <laughs> Huh? Oh, yeah, 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 see, I've been working with her since, I met you in 2010, yeah, at the Stockholm meeting, yep. <laughs> well, do you mean, do you mean I am? Do you mean I am? <laughs> um, okay, yeah, good. Well, I, okay, so here's the thing. You don't have to start at the scale I did with this particular project. I mean, I, you could start at a larger scale. You can. I mean, if you feel you have political backing, right, and financial backing, or it depends on what it is. You might not need money, right? Maybe you can do the project without a specific amount of cash, right? It depends on where you feel most comfortable, you know, doing it from, you see? Because initially, this guy, the main collaborator, he's, I didn't list it, but Bill Schuster, he wanted to do the whole city of Cleveland at once. I was like, you're out of your mind. I said, there's no way I will take that on. We will fail miserably because it, it was, you know, so much of an undertaking, right? And I learned from you know, Lance Gunderson, who's like, you know, you know, famous ecologist guy. Craig and I have known him forever. He has run these projects in the Everglades and in Grand Canyon. These are massive systems, right? And that's what they try to do. They do take on these massive systems because guess what? The sex here. You know, the, you know, Congress likes it in the U.S. You know, you can get an administration behind it. But guess what? They failed because it's just too much. Now, I mean, can you do it? Uh, could this have begun at, as, you know, the Rain Garden Project? I mean, 
I started at that small, small scale because I thought that was the way to go. But that was my opinion of it, just based on mine, right? There's other types of projects you can think of. It doesn't have to start at that small of a scale. It's, a, it's your read of your situation, right? I mean, the politics, the law, these things, it can, it can happen at any scale, I think. It just depends on how difficult it, it looks like it's gonna be based on conceptual models, you know, simulation models, stakeholder input, and... and, and Small ones, and they don't scale. Maybe then in the Netherlands, you need to start at a larger scale. I just <laughs> make. No, because it's a smaller country. See, that's not good. But that's not good. That's it, that you don't. Yes, yeah, so maybe you start at a higher scale because the Netherlands is not that big anyway. So maybe start. Really, I mean, you, do you. No, but that's that's not necessarily I mean, because you can you can still have it be you know kind of you, it can flow both ways. Think of it that way in terms of like maybe it's it's starting at the top, right? Like even me, U.S. government, right? But we went down, right, and then brought it back up. So think of it that way. You see, maybe that's what it has to be coordinated from, and that's actually what I think like with a lot of like governance is that there has to be that set of you know laws, you know that that set the stage for the game, right, or that set the rules for the game, right? And that that's all well not always, but at least in the U.S., you're always going to have federal laws going to trump the others, right? So there's always going to be that boundary, if you will. I mean, it's kind of a fuzzball boundary, but it's, it, it, there's a boundary. You know, we've learned that there's ways to you know, explore those capacities of that boundary, right? Yeah. Also, it seems like some positive feedback really works to help organizations. You might need to explain that. <laughs> Contagion. But she's saying they've not been able to do that here. Right. That they keeps so, that it keeps uh, dying. Yeah. It, that's what. It, so maybe that's. I'm just speculating. But hey, started from you know the, the federal level, the national level. It's not that big of a country. I mean, spatially. Right, and then, but then you have it, and you can, but don't just be like command and control, or it's just dictated from above. But it can be, you know, sub delegate subsidiarity principles where you can do with, you know, with what you can, right? And also the engagement, where some of it comes from below, some of it's from above, right? I'm just speculating. Yeah. They say that, or you say that? They say that? No, they think that. Well, guess what? But, but the pilot project dies, so does it really work? <laughs> I mean, okay. I mean, I wouldn't have picked Cleveland, Ohio, <laughs> but that's just, you know, it was already, that, that, that choice was made, you know, uh, by, basically there was politics involved with it too, you know. Um, there was other places, I think it actually could even work better in a smaller city, depending, and again, it's like, as you say, you're hitting some spots probably are more friendly to these ideas than others, right? I mean, uh, it just depends on your circumstances, you know. This city was really down on its luck, so they were open to it. Other places, eh, it's kind of like, well, we don't need to do this, you know? I mean, we, we don't need to be worried about this nonsense. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So they, they were willing to, to go with, because even if this, even, if, yeah, even if you, 
No, it's it, it's true. I mean, they're one that one like that, and some of the other ones that did it too. But Omaha is not that way, and they did it. You know, um, where he's talking about in Nebraska, they were not. I mean, Omaha's in good shape, but they did it too because they they were still under the same problem. They still had to because the you know EPA and the Department of Justice said, look, you are going to have to deal with this water, public health and water quality issue. We've been telling you for 25 years. Now it's no joke. You're going to get civil penalties every year, and you know cities can't afford that. So they had to come up with a plan to actually deal with the issue. And then it was so expensive. I mean, the the the, the bill or the, the the price tag for the gray plan for gray infrastructure plan, the pipe plan, for the city of Cleveland was five billion dollars over 25 years. For but for, for a city like that, which is so economically depressed, you know how that went over. I mean, I'm surprised there weren't like you know pitchforks and torches. And, you know, I mean, anyway. But yeah. So it, anyway, yeah. Read the room. I don't know about that. <laughs> no, it won't. It won't. No. So scale, scaling up shouldn't always be your goal, and sometimes it's just trying to spend that into a project and then trying to get the rest of it. Because this thing just can't scale up that you can't have a problem. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to That's a good way to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I think you know. Yeah. You're low. The, yeah, the whole. Yeah, but Nicole, you don't have to write any law. No. Just find the untapped capacity. Yeah, That's in the already existing law. <laughs> Uh, 
private land. Yeah. 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 On private yeah. land. It's, it, the goal hasn't been achieved, but we're, it's in moving towards it, you see? I mean, because it takes a long time. I mean, that's the thing that we learned. But it was starting it from scratch, really, quite honestly. To, I, you know, I'm not going to say it was fun. I mean, yeah, I, I'm glad I did it, but I learned a ton, obviously. I learned an incredible amount, more than I ever knew. You know, until, I mean, in hindsight, I learned more. I mean, because the way we set it up initially was just adaptive management, adaptive governance, right? And that was from the literature. I'd never done one of these projects on the ground before. So I read, you know, I knew that stuff real well. And I had like Lance Gunderson and some other, you know, him, AM gurus and whatever, resilience, resilience gurus helped me design the project. And then when we started and got into it, it became, you know, ran into barriers and, you know, pain, you know, difficulties and, and things changed through time. And then it became, you know, different things, right? I mean, some parts of it fell apart and then it, but overall, I mean, I'm amazed that it, it, it came out as well as it did you know, because it was really difficult. But demonstrating that then now shows there's a much easier path to do it and we, it, because it's, it's there out there now how to do it, how to get these things done. Like as far as like, like permitting to get a curb cut, you know, stuff like this. That was, there was no permit for that. We had to figure out how to do that, you know? So that's navigation of that type of stuff. And now it's known. I mean, you can, you, City of Cleveland has a, you know, a, a boilerplate way to do that type of thing. See what I mean? Stuff like that. So it's, it, the, the pain is to, so that's what's really disappointing to hear that you have all these pilot projects here that start and then die. Because then you put all this work in and then nothing, it doesn't continue on. So, but maybe there's, it may, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, application of all those ideas I told you about. Because I used to be. Yeah, because this stuff, when I started like adaptive management, I was just right, criticizing it as like a, like a legal and resilient scholar. I was just trashing it, you know? That was way easier. I really liked that. <laughs> I mean, you know, but actually having to do it, <laughs> my God, it was hard. But I mean, I'm glad I did it because, you know, I thought, you know, I don't have credibility. I'm just like, you know, one of these others who's just throwing darts, who just, you know, is just you know, a hater. You know what I mean when I say that? Just a hater. Somebody who's not really going to go and, put, you know, do the dirty work. They don't like that. They like you just. <laughs> it's easier just to say it and then just you know. Now you guys go do it. Come on, I gave you this great idea. That's the expert. I, I told I told you what to do. Just go do it. I can't speak to this.